There's no need to get tense. Relax with Flux Condenser. Subscribe, baby, subscribe. In this series, we'll be building, assembling, and restoring a 1960s, 1970s era component stereo system. Before we begin, let's review what the basic components of a typical component stereo are and some important things to consider if you're planning on putting together your own system. Much of this info will also help if you're putting together a modern system. Modern components often have video or surround processing you won't find in antique equipment, but the principles are the same. And believe it or not, much of the most esoteric, expensive audio equipment made today is designed for basic two-channel stereo using vacuum tubes in lieu of transistors. That's just like the old stuff. And in fact, you'd be hard-pressed to hear any improvements in a modern system compared to a comparable antique one. If you saw the first video in this series, you'll recall that I first fell in love with high-fidelity stereo sound listening to my father's stereo in the early 1970s. Let's use the components in his stereo as an example. I told you my dad had a pair of Nova Pro headphones. Those phones plugged into a realistic SA700 solid state integrated amplifier. Solid state means it used more modern transistors and diodes instead of tubes. Integrated amplifier means it includes an amplifier and preamplifier in one chassis. Preamplifiers are commonly referred to as preamps for short and are sometimes called control amplifiers because they serve as the main controller for the system. The record player, tape decks, radio tuner, and other source components all plug into the preamp, and it allows you to select which one you want to listen to. A preamp also gives you volume control. Without it, the amplifier would always play at full blast. Many preamps also include bass and treble tone controls to help shape the sound of the music. Another common feature of a preamp is a phono stage, which allows you to plug in a record player. A high fidelity record player is called a turntable, and it should only be plugged into a phono input. If you plug it into a regular CD, tape, or tuner input, it's not going to work. That's because the signal coming from the turntable's needle and cartridge are not only tiny, but also a little weird. It's weird because the low frequencies have been reduced and the high frequencies have been increased. Almost all records have been made to play this way since the mid-50s because it's the only way to squeeze high-fidelity sound into the microscopic vinyl grooves. Commonly referred to as the RIAA curve, this type of pre-emphasis equalization is somewhat similar to Dolby noise reduction, which is used in tape players to reduce background hiss. Tape players have built-in circuitry to equalize the signal correctly for playback, though, while turntables generally do not. So in addition to boosting the tiny signal from the turntable's cartridge, a preamp's phono stage also properly re-equalizes the RIAA curve. In addition to a preamplifier, an integrated amplifier, like my dad's, includes an amplifier. An amplifier, or amp for short, takes the volume-adjusted, tone-equalized signal from the preamp and amplifies it to power the speakers. An amplifier's output power is measured in watts, and sometimes the model number will hint at how many watts it's rated for. My dad's SA700 could deliver 70 total watts of low distortion power. I say total watts because it could actually only produce 35 watts per channel. That means it could deliver 35 watts to the left speaker and 35 to the right for a total of 70. Before the mid-70s, some amps were rated by their total power, while others were rated by watts per channel. By the mid-70s, rating amps by watts per channel thankfully started to become standard. Amplifier output wattage is an important consideration because more watts allows the system to play at higher volumes with less distortion. In a small room, 35 watts per channel is usually plenty to power most speakers to room-filling sound without distortion. In a larger room, or for party-level volumes though, many speakers will need 50, 80, or 100 watts or more per channel to play without distortion. So, how big your room is and how loudly you want your system to play are big factors to consider when choosing amplifier wattage. Another important consideration is speaker sensitivity, which I'll tell you about a little bit later. 
So an integrated amp is a component that integrates a preamp and amp in one chassis. But what happens if a radio tuner is added to an integrated amp? Well, it becomes what's known as a receiver. Here's the Marantz receiver I convinced my dad to buy in the early 1980s. Not the actual one, I regrettably sold that in college, but the same model. As you can see, it has a preamp, radio tuner, and an amp, all in one component. To this day, receivers are popular because they're a cost-effective way to get three audio components in one. Of course, when you put all this stuff in one chassis, some compromises must be made. One chassis means one power transformer for one, so the power available to each circuit is more limited. And because there are so many circuits in one box, it's more difficult to isolate them and unwanted noise can creep into the signal. These are the main reasons separate components are available as an alternative to receivers. Each component has its own power supply and chassis, so performance can be maximized. This was especially important in the early days of stereo because tubes required more power and components had far more stray wiring that could pick up interference. Once transistors and PC boards became standard, the benefits of separate components versus a receiver became less noticeable. For large systems requiring huge power output though, separate amps may still be necessary, as even the best receivers can't match the best amps for power output. In my main system, I actually have two stereo amps just to drive the left and right speakers. One amp drives the low frequency drivers and the other drives the highs. Using two amplifiers this way is called bi-amping and requires speakers that allow for this type of connection. Mono amplifiers are also available for the ultimate in power and noise isolation. Mono is the opposite of stereo. Instead of two channels for left and right, there's just one. This monoamp by Macintosh is capable of an astonishing 1200 watts. Monoamps are often referred to as monoblocks. Four monoblocks would be required to drive a biamped pair of stereo speakers. As you can imagine, this can get very, very expensive. Even though I was first introduced to stereo through headphones, I actually prefer listening to speakers. And I think that's true of most people of my generation. Actually, this guy's not really my generation, as I was only about 15 when this photo was taken. I had barely kissed a girl, let alone drank champagne and partied with the beautiful blonde. Still, I remember hearing these speakers in the Radio Shack store in 1982 and loving them. Radio Shack equipment may not have been the absolute high end, but they never really got the credit they deserved for well-made equipment at a good price. Nowadays, younger people seem to prefer earphones or headphones, which are great when you're on the run or don't want to disturb your neighbors. Headphones can also be incredibly faithful to the music source and aren't influenced by the room or furnishings which can dramatically change the sound of speakers. Still, for sharing music or really feeling like the musicians are in the room, I prefer speakers. My dad's speakers were a pair of KLH Model 6s. The Model 6 is a typical good quality speaker from the 60s, which uses a design still in use today. First, it's a component stereo speaker, which means it doesn't have a built-in amp, and two are meant to be used as a stereo pair. Second, it's an acoustic suspension design, which means the tune box enclosure is sealed with no openings called ports. In very general terms, Ported speakers are known for deeper bass extension, while acoustic suspension speakers are known for tighter, more accurate bass. There are great and not so great examples of both types though, so I wouldn't choose a speaker just because it's ported or acoustic suspension. And third, the Model 6 is a two-way design. Two-way means it has two drivers, a big one called a woofer and a small one called a tweeter. The woofer reproduces the low bass frequencies and the tweeter the high treble frequencies. Inside, there's a simple electronic circuit called a crossover, which divides the signal coming from the amplifier into low and high frequencies and sends them to the proper driver. Some speakers have a third type of driver called a mid-range, which reproduces the mid-frequencies. A mid-range allows a speaker to have a larger, more powerful woofer. That's because as woofer sizes increase, 
their ability to reproduce low frequency improves, but their ability to reproduce mid frequencies diminishes. A mid range fills in the missing gap between the large woofer and tweeter. Speakers with a woofer, tweeter, and mid range are called three way speakers. Component speakers are commonly rated for frequency response, sensitivity, power handling, and impedance. I couldn't find the full manufacturer's specifications for the Model 6s, so let's look at the specs for the somewhat similar Altec Lansing Model 3. A frequency response rating tells you the lowest and highest frequencies the speaker can reproduce at approximately the same level from high to low volumes. This is called the flat response. The Model 3 has a flat response for frequencies as low as 50 cycles per second and as high as 20,000. That covers almost the entire spectrum of sound humans can hear, except for the very lowest tones. For that, a speaker needs a frequency response that goes down to about 20 cycles per second. Keep in mind though that a speaker's frequency response is tested in special anechoic chambers which cancel almost all reflected echoes. This is so the effects that rooms have on the speaker's sound are minimized. Once you get your speakers home, their frequency response and overall sound will be greatly affected by the room they're placed in and their proximity to walls, furniture, and other hard and soft surfaces. Also note that any audio component specification is only as trustworthy as its source. Many cheaper, no-name brands vastly exaggerate specs, so stay away from anything that seems too good to be true. You can also turn to professional reviews found in magazines such as Stereo Review, Stereophile, and others which publish the results of their own equipment tests. A speaker's power rating tells you the maximum amplifier power it can take for a continuous period without being damaged. The Model 3 is rated to handle 35 watts of continuous power. That in no way means though that you must use a 35 watt amp. As you can see, Altec states that amplifiers rated anywhere from 10 to 100 watts per channel are recommended. Using an amp on the lower wattage range will play the speaker fine at modest volume levels, but won't be able to play it at high volume levels without the amp distorting. Using an amp at the higher wattage range will allow the speaker to be played at higher volume levels, but if it's continually run at a level past 35 watts, the speaker itself may distort and the speaker's voice coils could be permanently damaged. Even though Altec states the Model 3 can only handle 35 watts of continuous power, it considers an amp of 100 watts acceptable because when listening to music, a 100 watt amp won't continuously put out 100 watts. Music is always changing levels, so the amp's output is always changing as well. Just look at this 150 watt per channel amp from Macintosh. As you can see, most of the meter's range is dedicated to just 0 to 15 watts. That's because a great majority of the time, that's all that will be required from the amp. It's only when music reaches crescendo-like levels that the amp will briefly be required to output 15 to 150 watts. This is known as transient or peak power. And the power a speaker can handle for brief periods is specified as its peak power handling. A speaker's impedance rating tells you how much electrical resistance it presents to the amplifier. Most home stereo speakers like the Model 3 are rated for 8 ohms and almost any home stereo amp will work fine with it. Some speakers, such as many Klipsch models, are rated for 4 ohms though, which will also work fine with almost any high quality amp or receiver. In fact, there are some benefits to efficiency which can be realized by doing this. With cheaper low-end stereos though, driving a 4 ohm speaker may present a difficult load, so caution should be observed. Antique components, especially ones from the early 60s or older, can sometimes have atypical impedance ratings that are considerably outside the 4 to 8 ohm range, and for those you'll need to be extremely careful, and make sure your equipment is a suitable match. The final main specification you'll often see for speakers is sensitivity. It tells you how loud a speaker will play, measured in decibels, from about 1 meter away with a 2.83 volt or 1 watt input signal. 
This is actually pretty important as it tells you how efficient a speaker will be at squeezing out power from the precious watts coming from your amplifier. For the human ear to even notice a difference in volume level, it has to change by about 3 decibels. And to increase the volume of a speaker by 3 decibels, it takes a massive doubling of the wattage from the amplifier. At the same volume level, that means that the Model 3, with a sensitivity of 90.5, requires less than a third of the power as its cousin, the Model 1, with a sensitivity of only 84. That's pretty astonishing, and why I consider sensitivity to be the most meaningful speaker specification to consider. Not because high sensitivity speakers are better, but because it's the only spec that really tells you something useful. Otherwise, the most important thing to consider with speakers isn't specs, but how they sound. And for that, the only test equipment you need are your ears. One last note on sensitivity. Just as with our example comparing Altex Model 1 and 3, it's often the case that as speakers get larger, sensitivity increases. So large speakers are often more efficient and require less wattage compared to smaller ones. That's a little counterintuitive, but pretty eye-opening. Or ear-opening, as it were. Now that we've reviewed preamps, amps, receivers, and speakers, it's time we moved on to building our vintage stereo system. In addition to the components we've already discussed, future videos in the series will also address turntables and tape players. To stay updated, please subscribe and click the bell. And if you like this video, give it a thumbs up. I'll see you soon.